ghost of the octoroon mistress On a blustery December night in New Orleans, when the chill blows in from the northeast with a spittering and a spattering and a howling, you may see her on the steep, slippery slope, gable roof in of a Royal Street townhouse. A lonely girl, pacing and shivering in the wind, entirely naked, her olive skin whipped by the elements. Her name is Julie, this sad apparition. And she lived in the 1850s, when New Orleans was rich and boisterous. But they call her the Octoroon Mistress because she was an eighth Negro. And that was the root of her tragedy. Julie was young and impossibly ravishingly beautiful, and a French nobleman made his, her his mistress. She loved him so much, and she dreamed of marrying him, her own Marquis. Maybe he loved her too. But a marriage between a white aristocrat and a girl who had even the flimsiest tendrils of African roots could never be. And so he would always demur, or evade the issue until at last she became desperate. One bitter December night, as the wind curled cold and wet about those elegant war cups, disheveled even then, they had a row that could be heard all the way down the street, even through the tightly fastened shutters. And she, in a fit of passion, went out onto the roof, naked as she was, to proclaim her love to him for all the world. And he, and no doubt expecting her to calm down and come back in, passion spent, went out drinking with a friend and returned to bed to drift off to sleep. But the next morning, the bed was empty, and he, in a state of panic, ascended to the roof. There he found her, her pitifully exposed and lifeless body, now entirely white and stiff, curled up on the slates, her mouth open as if to kiss the wind, and raindrops running down her cheeks like giant tears from those once gorgeous eyes that now stared blankly into the dawn sky. Who knows how much he wept for her, his octoroon mistress? Who knows how he quivered as he carried her inside and laid her on their bed, hoping maybe that the warmth and the memories of their lovemaking would somehow restore life to that icy flesh. But 170 years on, Julie's sad spirit still stalks that winter rooftop, wailing her love to anyone who might hear. In summer now, though, it seems her, her phantom descends from the lonely rooftop and clothes her nakedness in rosy toil to haunt the bottom of the cup tea room on the ground floor where they serve lukewarm tea and tell fortunes. If you pause a while for a second cup in the gaslight of that rickety salon, fortune teller and psychic Otis Briggs will tell you of his eerie encounters with the octoroon mistress. He's seen Julie's reflection in a tiny goldfish pond in the back courtyard, Biggs insists. Julie's room, he says, was just above the pond in the building's former slave quarters. Once, the tea room's cashier, Connie Kramer, recalls, she and a friend named Lucy glimpsed 
Julie's pink skirt in the courtyard. Lucy said, look, and we saw the skirt whisk around the back corner, says Kramer. I said, what's that? And Lucy said, that's Julie. Just then, we heard the giggle. Lucy said, I'm out of here. I said, I'm right behind you. 